Good evening, everyone. I'm Soraya Wintersmith from GBH News, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this month's Beyond the Page with Jabari Asim. In a few months, we'll be joined by Jabari Asim, an accomplished poet, playwright, and writer. Jabari has been described as one of the most influential African-American literary critics of his generation. He served as the editor-in-chief of the Crisis Magazine, the NAACP's flagship journal of politics, culture, and ideas, and as an editor at the Washington Post, where he wrote a syndicated column on politics, pop culture, and social issues. He is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship in Creative Arts and is the author of 13 books for children and eight books for adults, including Yonder, which you will get a chance to get a signed copy of later in the evening. Jabari is currently the Alma Lewis Distinguished Fellow and a professor at Emerson College. He is the Graduate Program Director of the MFA Program in the Department of Writing, Literature, and Publishing. Now, before I welcome Jabari on screen, I want to explain how this evening's event will work. We're using Zoom webinar, and as our audience, we can't see you or hear you, but we do want to hear from you. Uh, you can ask questions during the course of the conversation by opening the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and typing in your questions. You can put your questions in at any point in time during the conversation this evening. We'll do our best to address as many of them as we can throughout the night. And if you see a question that you really want to hear the answer to, vote for it by clicking the thumbs up icon in the Q&A tab, and that'll vote the most popular questions to the top of the list, and we'll try and get to them. Uh, to activate Zoom's automated captioning feature, select the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen, select live transcript, and then two transcript display options will pop up. We, we recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript, and then a sidebar window opens where you can see what each speaker is saying. Please keep in mind that closed captioning might be slightly delayed. Okay. So now that that housekeeping is done, it's my pleasure to introduce Jabari Asim. Hello, hello, hello. Hey. There we are. Took a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but we got it, we get it, we get it. <laughs> Excellent. So. Um, I'm really excited to discuss this novel. It was such a smooth read, even though the subject matter is really, really heavy. Um, the first thing that I want to ask is, like, at what point did you know that you had this story inside of you? Uh, that's that's a very good question, uh, Soraya. And first of all, I just want to thank you for for hosting this event. It's a real pleasure to uh, to meet and talk with you. Um, I'm not sure. Let's see. That, I mean, it's a really good question. Let, let, let me think about it a second. Um, it, it began, I guess, with with fragments, you know, not not quite a, a complete story. Uh, characters sort of talking to me. Uh, so it began with me sort of writing down snatches of dialogue, I guess, mm -hmm. probably before I even had a story. Uh, and once the characters began to um, converse with me in a consistent way where I felt confident that I could return to them. I began to think about it in terms of a novel and said to myself, okay, what kind of arc can this have? What kind of story can I assemble around these people, quote unquote, uh, that I've met? All right. Um, now I have to ask, which one talked to you first? Aha, wonderful question. <laughs> uh, and, and initially, uh, it was William, um, who's, who's, and I guess we should tell people who, who aren't familiar with the novel that there are multiple narrators. Um, and but initially there there were not there was it was just William and it was William's story but mm -hmm. uh, but the other characters began to interfere or intervene and say <laughs> well that that that's William's version of events let me let me tell you how it looked from from my point of view right and that's when I began to think okay maybe maybe that's a different way of telling the story letting each of these people uh, these principal characters kind of say. I set out to do this, or I was born here, or this is how I got involved, and to kind of take the story from there. It's such a heavy genre, I think, when you're dealing with oppression and slavery and sadness and the snuffing out of hope. Um, where do you go to 
deal with those emotions as you're writing? Uh, well, I mean, a couple things. One, if, if the material is getting too challenging, even for me, that's a sign that it may be too challenging even for the reader. So that's mm -hmm. one of the things I'm always thinking about. You want the reader to absorb um, you know, the facts and muscle of your character's experience, but you don't want them to scream and throw the book across the room, right? <laughs> so, so, so you're kind of monitoring yourself. At the same time, you know, the novel is very much about joy. It's about transcendence. It's about how does one respond to being confined in impossible circumstances? And, you know, there's so many examples of that in real life to pull from. For example, the fact that African-Americans um, can, can think and thrive and laugh and be joyous and love each other. Um, it, all of that is evidence that our ancestors survived and transcended this ridiculously cruel circumstance, right? And so I wanted to make sure that the novel reflected the entire experience and its complexity, not just, not just the oppression, not just the brutality, but the moments of humor, the mm -hmm. moments of joy, the moments of genuine affection and, and teasing and, and all these kinds of things. So it was important to um, sort of lay out the circumstances fairly graphically in order to demonstrate to readers what the characters were, were going to overcome mm -hmm. and what they were going to try to overcome uh, through the course of the novel. I think that you did a remarkable job, not just with the outward expression of emotion, but kind of like the secret motivators, even between some of the women in the story, right? Like the plantation um, owner's wife and the jealousy towards some of the women and the tenderness. I was really struck by the tenderness between the Black characters and a where do you go to get that? Right, right. Uh, I mean, a lot of it's, well, I, first is experience, right? What, what I've seen around me, uh, the community I grew up in, the family that I'm privileged to belong to. I know that these things exist in abundance, right? Friendship, affection, loyalty, uh, dependability. Uh, so we know that these, these things are real and I have to filter them through my imagination. I have to begin to uh, think, you know, how can this be a, a fanciful story, a story that both uh, challenges the reader, but entertains the reader at the mm -hmm. same time, right? So, uh, so very much out of, you know, li lived experience, observed experience. Uh, I mean, these, you could, you could take those Black female characters that you mentioned and remove them out of that circumstance and put them in an entirely different time, an entirely different setting, and you would see the same kinds of relationships, the same kinds of bonds you could you could set them on a front porch in in Kansas during the depression right and there, and it would be the that same exchange of 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 energy and and confidences uh so i mean so that that's one of the tests for me the characters have to be able to you know exist in the time in which i placed them but to also sort of exist outside of that time in mm -hmm. order to be credible mm -hmm. i wonder um hmm Mm -hmm. There's a lot of places that we could go from here. I wonder when you are writing stories, not like the research book uh, we were saying before we got on that I read the N-word before, <laughs> but right before I went to college. So in some ways, this is really cool to be having a conversation with you now. Um, but I remember that there was a lot of I think I heard someone say it was clear that you were a bibliophile in reading that book. And I wonder how much of that like urge to research played into this piece. I felt like I saw historical figures in a lot of what I read. Sure, um, I mean, that, that that's a really good question and I appreciate it. And it's interesting uh, that if we use my earlier research-based nonfiction book, The N-Word, uh, it was really instructive to me in that, um, you know, as, as a writer who's still finding his form and finding his voice and finding the ideal approach to material, um, what I learned from that book is at some point the research must stop. Mm. The storytelling has to begin, whether it's a true story or a story uh, that you're making up. At some point, you've got to put that reading aside. That's really difficult for me, because I, I, always, I always say, no, there's 10 more books I want to read about this subject before you know I express my own thoughts. And, mm. and you can't read everything. You cannot. You must make a genuine effort to read as much as you can. But at some point, uh, the research becomes a way of running away from the writing, the actual mm. task that you've, you've set yourself 
upon. So, um, so uh, yeah, I, I did do a lot of reading, but now when I'm doing reading, I also have that voice in my head saying, okay, <laughs> this is a means to an end. Eventually you're going to stop <laughs> and you're going to write the story that you said you were going to write. So yeah, there, there's, you know, there's quite a bit of, of research that went into it. Um, at the same time, you know, uh, Toni Morrison has this, this wonderful quote uh, where she says, you know, at some point uh, you have to stop, uh, pardon me, the research to give your imagination room to breathe and mm. expand. Uh -oh. um, so spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't gotten all the way through or anyone who is just starting, <clears throat> puts um, slaves or enslaved people and slave masters in terms of thieves and stolen. And there are a couple of other ways that you frame uh, the heinous institution that I just thought, wow, it's very simple. It's a simple thing to put it that way, but how did that come to you? One of the things that, that I'm always interested in is what I call narrative uh, combat, which is the mm -hmm. clash of stories, right? Um, and a, a simple clash of stories is, um, you know, you're you're in one car and I'm I'm in the car behind you and I rear I rear in your car, right? And you say, well, um, you rear in my car because you accelerated when you should have stopped. And I'll say, actually, no, you stopped when you should have accelerated, right? And so we have so we so we have these we have these two different two different stories. And much of of the American story um, is a consequence of of swirling. Uh, competing stories and stories about the the African experience in America is it's it's always regarded as dangerous information, which is why you see these campaigns across the country against you know this boogeyman they've created called critical race theory. When actually most of the time, what they're identifying as examples of quote unquote critical race theory are really just facts from American history, right? So there's this there's this aversion uh, to truth, and so one of the things I wanted to look at was how uh, do people in these circumstances view themselves and how do they view the people who, who hold them captive and how would the language reflect that if the language wasn't policed by the people who have them uh, in captivity? They certainly would never refer uh, to those people as masters. They would probably refer to them as thieves. So I wanted the language to, to reflect that um, and, and to sort of look at the, the moral evaluations that were taking place at, at the same time. And then going a little deeper with that, I think we see it manifested probably in William the most that he's super cognizant of point of view and the difference between the story that is told by the people who are enslaving people and the people who are enslaved. This is brilliant. This is brilliant. <laughs> so William understands narrative combat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, actually, most of the characters comment on that at one point or another. You know, William says to his best friend Cato, "We can shape this. It's all in the telling, yeah. right? So it's, it's all about uh, how it's framed." And uh, William's partner Margaret says, mm -hmm. "You know, um, how the story is told depends on who's telling it and where where they were." essentially in the space where the where the action unfolds. So yeah, the characters are very aware of that. And I would argue that uh, African-Americans have always been aware of that, right? That there's there's been a story uh, that comes from outside of their communities that is imposing itself uh, upon their experiences. Toni Morrison called it the master narrative. Mm. And she said, the master narrative has nothing to do with the race. It has to do with power. Right, it's the story that the powerful impose upon the powerless. Right, so it's not always race based. It can be very, uh, pardon me, very um, economic based. Right, in which you know, uh, built billionaires kind of ex express the state at the state of the nation and, and what's best uh, for all of its citizens, as opposed to working class people or, or poor people uh, having that voice. So that that is, I hope that the novel is operating. Uh, on multiple levels. And one is just a story, right? Of, of, of people uh, resisting against great, uh, great odds, resisting against uh, injustice. On another level, uh, 
I hope that it's very much a philosophical exploration where certain questions are what what is morality what is what is moral behavior and what what kinds of behavior are, are, are justifiable right um, that, that we can rationalize and, and sleep with ourselves how how real how substantial is conscience for example uh, questions like that and then also uh, it was important to me to expose the philosophical life of black people right mm -hmm. to show that from the very beginning we've pondered the same questions that the that the philosophers ponder and when black people do it in their art it, uh, the critics tend to call it folklore but when other cultures do it it becomes philosophy mm -hmm. right so one of the things i wanted to do was have these black people have very serious conversations about their place in the cosmos their role their role in the universe what's out there how did they get you know get to be in these circumstances Cato says the question we ask ourselves is not uh, why were we born, but why were we born there mm -hmm. in those circumstances, right? And these are these are philosophical questions about fate and destiny and whether the individual has the power uh, to influence one's life's path, right? And and what kind of circumstances and people may intervene and and affect that. So um, so I wanted all of that to be operating too on on some level even as people followed the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. William kind of sits with himself midway through or towards the end in another spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't gotten all the way through, you might want to mute yourself in at the point where he replaces the overseer character and then goes to the elder and realizes that he's having some internal struggle about where he is now. I think that this is brilliant, not just because it's brilliant, but I know that I've heard you speaking in other interviews about the need for complexity in Black characters, oftentimes in artwork. Um, we Black people, we feel a responsibility to show like a perfect person, an unflawed person. There's this weight of responsibility of representation, yes, yes. race. But I didn't feel that so much here. In fact, I saw that your characters were struggling with themselves. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like it's as as individuals, we all have, uh, you know, virtuous, heroic aspects to our personality. We also have the underside the flaws, be, you know, not not because we're terrible people, but because we are people, right? And and people are inherently imperfect. Uh, and so one of the things that William has to deal with is he's suddenly put in a position of authority. So among enslaved people. So mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? Do, do you uh, do you attempt to reform? Do you attempt to establish a system that's fair and just and, and humane? Uh, or do you begin to take on the worst qualities of power? Mm -hmm. Right. Do, do you begin to abuse uh, your situation in the same way that your your predecessors did? And he has uh, conversations with his elder, uh, Guinea Jack, who very forcefully cautions him uh, uh, against taking on the values of, of the very people who have been tormenting him and, and oppressing him. And, you know, in, in theory, um, that that's fairly simple. But, you know, in reality, when you suddenly have access uh, to goods and services that you did not have before, who, who's to say how one would behave in those circumstances? So like you say, he struggles with that. He, he wrestles with it. Mm -hmm. I love it. If you're just joining us, we're talking with poet, playwright, and author Jabari Asim. If you want to ask him anything, put your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom. It is located in the toolbar at the very bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to get to everyone's questions. Um, why yonder as the title? This is not a word that we hear used a whole lot up here <laughs> in New England anyway. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, number one, I like the way it sounds. I, I'm, I'm really into the way words sound. I have words that I like independent of their meaning and context because I like the way they fall off the tongue. And yonder is, is one of those words for me, but also because the characters, um, their experience is so limited to this place where they've been confined that they actually have no idea what is beyond the plantation's borders. They've heard stories, they've heard rumors, they've heard tall tales. They don't know because they've never been, right? So one of the philosophical musings uh, involves them speculating on what, what might be yonder. What do you think is yonder? 
Mm -hmm. What do you think is beyond those gates? And so I I, I thought it was a a good way of sort of encapsulating um, the circumstances of these people who ultimately decide it would be great to be yonder uh, no matter what's there because it's not here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I know that you wanted to be a poet at one point in your writing career and then you switch to sort of straight lace writing when you figured out that you could make money <laughs> when you were doing it. <laughs> but that's, I wonder when you go ahead. No, I was gonna say that sounds so crass, but it's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um when you're going through your drafts, the idea of writing a book intimidates me, even though I'm a journalist and I write pieces and editors frequently like say this is too much, we have to cut it down. The thought of writing a whole book It's so intimidating, especially when you want to nail all of the lines and write with flair and make it beautiful and impactful. How do you know when you have captured like the essence of what you mean to express and that it's pretty, that you use the right words and that you don't need to go back and revise? Um, I think you can always go back and revise, but again, mm-hmm. that that's part of the uh, that's part of experience being able to say, okay, you have to let this go, right? You have to let it go, uh, and so it's easier for me now than it was when I was because no, let me let me just let me <laughs> run that through my computer one more time, uh, and I'm, I'm fortunately I'm I'm just not at that stage. I'm confident enough now where uh, if there's if there's some huge shortcomings in it, there are are people in the system who will who will point them out to me. You know, I had a brilliant editor on this book, um, African-American woman named Dawn Davis, who's you know probably one of the best book editors ever. And I've known her a long time. It was the first time we actually worked together, pardon me, on a book. And, uh, you know, people like her, um, you know, they keep you in check. They point out the parts that don't work and say, this needs, this needs more work. This is perfect. Let's leave this. Have, or, and a lot of times it's in the form of questions. Have you thought about this? But what about this? Well, mm-hmm. what would happen here? You know, and uh, you kind of take that information and you you go back to your computer and you you decide what's useful and what's helpful to you. Ultimately, it's up to the author, right? The author makes those decisions and everything else is a suggestion, right? So my job is to sort of sift through those suggestions and say, <laughs> I could use that. No, nah, I'm not going to do that. You know, like that. I, you know, I have that that degree of freedom. But it was always my goal to write write books, right? I mean, I still write poetry. I still write in all the genres. But the form that I wanted my writing to take um, very early was books. So I was always kind of focused on that and, you know, always reading books. So I had a good idea about structure and, and pace and, and, and all that kind of thing. And I, I wanted to be prepared for my opportunity uh, when it came. And, and when it came, you know, fortunately, I was ready. In terms of structure, because the characters were coming to you piece by piece, did you know that you wanted to write um, multiple points of view, like to create one storyline? Yeah, I I knew it was going to be a novel. I knew it wasn't going to be a short story. You know, I wasn't thinking in those terms. I was really thinking about, uh, I want to write a novel. What what can the novel be about? Uh, And this is my this is my second novel, and I've also published a collection of short stories, linked short stories. So, you know, uh, fairly familiar with the form at this point. And that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking I want this to be a book length exploration mm-hmm. uh, of an experience, right, of, of a happening. Uh, so, yeah, from the very beginning, that's what I was thinking. Excellent. We're going to pause for the cause very quickly, um, and I am going to bring in my colleague, Janie, who is joining us to share a special offer with everyone. Janie, are you there? We're pausing. Janie, Janie, Janie. Hello, everybody. Yes, I am here. Hi, Soraya. Hi, Jabari. And hello to all of our audience members at home. Thanks so much for joining us during tonight's Beyond the Page event. You know, GBH aims to bring people together through the power of public media, inspiring you with culture and the arts, guided by an inclusive community first commitment. And now we ask you, our guests at home, to commit to GBH with an important donation of support. 
Tonight, if you give $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member, we'll send you a copy of Jabari Hassim's latest novel, Yonder, which redefines the American slavery novel. Yonder follows a group that calls themselves the Stolen as they are forced into arduous labor by their captors, the thieves. The Stolen endure day by day through the strength of their friendship. However, when a visiting minister preaches ideas of freedom, they must decide who to trust and whether to pursue the unknown. The New York Times describes Yonder as a fresh, sweeping, must-read tale. You can secure a copy of Yonder tonight and support GBH at the same time with your contribution of $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member. It's so easy and safe to do. Just click the link you see in the Zoom chat right now to be brought to a secure donation page at gbh.org slash support events. Again, that's gbh.org slash support events. Once you start reading this book, you will not wanna put it down, believe me. If you're already a member, we thank you so much for your support. And if you wish to become one and get a copy of Yonder tonight, during this special offer, just click the chat link and please make that donation. Audience support is essential to all the rewarding moments you spend in the company of GBH, keeping you informed, engaged, inspired, and connected when you need it. To our audience at home, thanks for connecting with us tonight and may you enjoy every page of Yonder until we see you next time at Beyond the Page in October. Now back to you, Soraya. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jamie. Uh, Jabari, is yep. the plantation owner, Mr. Green, based on like Josiah Knott and like the early minds of people who are studying Black people, studying and contributing to the scientific exploration of Black people early in America? See, Soraya, you have uh, what we might call an enhanced perspective because you've read that book. <laughs> <laughs> I like to read. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yes. I mean, um, one of the things that I wrote about in the end word quite a bit was scientific racism and the popularity of, of scientific racism. Um, and I, I talk about uh, real life people like Josiah Knott in that book. Uh, but I argue that Josiah Knott and people like him um, were uh, principally influenced by Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the sort of the the text of of scientific racism, which is Notes on the State of Virginia, which is you know just really horrible, horrible prose that that you know has has no basis in reality. Mm. That is that is supposedly you know based on on uh, black people, uh, black people that he observed. Mm -hmm. um, in quotation marks. And um, so Cannonball Green, the character uh, to whom you refer in Yonder, is uh, a man who's been fascinated with these, these developments uh, in terms of scientific racism and wants to contribute to them. Uh, so some of his ideas um, were shaped by, by uh, people like Thomas Jefferson, but also uh, George Washington, who is you know, known for um, timing his slaves, you know, with, with a watch all the time to see, you know, what, what was the best and most efficient way uh, to work them uh, to maximum effort, just short of killing them, right? Um, and so uh, Cannonball Green is a fictional character, but very much reflective of, of um, uh, real life uh, practitioners of, of scientific racism and of uh, enslavement governed by principles that were derived from scientific racism. Mm -hmm. We see that research at play. And then in the book, there are positive practices and not so positive practices. The idea, right, of like pickling someone, but also the idea of like giving a new life in the world, some words to hold on to because Presumably, they don't have anything else except what they can maintain internally, what no one can take away from them. Are these 
based in any research or is this where our imagination cut in? Well, uh, the spiritual practices that the stolen engage in are made up, right? So the, the idea of the seven words that, that can uh, affect material reality uh, is, is something I made up. The whispering ceremony that a newborn uh, stolen child uh, undergoes made up. Mm -hmm. um, but pickling, which is a form of torture mm -hmm. of enslaved people, I won't go into the details of it. Uh, during our conversation, if you, if you read the book, uh, there'll, there'll be some discussion. Pickling was a, a favored form of punishment. Uh, but I learned about it by reading about uh, George Washington and his methods for controlling the people that, that he had stolen or, or purchased. Uh, and it was actually called pickling. Uh, I think I read about it in a book called uh, An Imperfect God by Henry Weincheck. I think that's where I got that, but I'm not entirely certain. I read so many books on, on Washington and, and Jefferson and, and, and people like that. But yeah, it, it's a real thing. Um, um, and so um, the instances of brutality uh, toward the uh, stolen that take place in the book are all rooted in actual historical incidents or practices. None, none of that is made up. Excellent. Um, going back to some of the things that you, I think, bring out in this book, I'm looking at it and I have posted some here. And one of the things that I was really struck by, um, as a Black man, this idea of Black male heartbreak kind of driving how men move through the world after an incident is happening. And then the idea of like this emasculation that happens because of bystander guilt. Talk about yes. that. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, uh, and I, I, one of the characters uh, talks about this in some detail. I can't remember if it's Margaret or, or Pandora, uh, but uh, she, is, she is aware that a uh, form of mental brutality that the men suffer from is the fact of their powerlessness, that mm -hmm. they can do nothing uh, and instances in which women, uh, black women are brutalized uh, in, in their presence and how this affects them uh, psychologically, right? So, uh, yes, yeah, so I did want to explore that. Uh, and then also you, you mentioned uh, black male heartbreak. Um, I wanted to examine how do you love uh, in circumstances in which you don't even get to choose mm -hmm. who you love. Mm -hmm. Let's say, you know, you're, you're a man, you love this woman and she loves you. It's not that simple, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because other people get to determine not only whether or not you can be with that person, but who you can be with, period, right? I mean, that's one of the things that Cannonball Green is into. You know, he's, he has studied animal husbandry. He has studied the breeding of livestock, right? So he wants to apply what he believes he's learned uh, to human beings. And human beings have things like romantic longing, right? And mm -hmm. sexual attraction and mm -hmm. things like that. And so that, that complicates it, right? That makes it uh, far less simple for him to carry out what he wants to do. So William and, and Cato are best friends. Cato is heartbroken uh, because he's lost someone uh, uh, whom he loved very much. He doesn't think he can ever recover from that. When we meet him, he believes that he is beyond repair, right? Uh, he, he, is, he's, he has lost his voice, essentially, right? And so uh, William is, is different in that William uh, never intends to love anybody. He, he doesn't he doesn't want that kind of attachment because he thinks that it can only lead to disaster. The minute he falls in love with a woman, that woman is going to be sold away or something bad's going to happen to her. And then where will that leave him? Mm -hmm. So for him, the way to avoid that is just never get involved. Right. No, no, no connections. Right. So they they kind of have almost opposing viewpoints, but they're best friends. So they have to debate these things and, and you know, pursue their paths in their in their own way. But. Uh, they are they are both right in that uh, when love happens, it's fraught, right? I mean, it's just it's just absolutely circumscribed by the possibility of disaster at all times. So there's a certain amount of urgency uh, to the relationships, right? It's like okay, we need to be together because we don't know how long we're going to get to stay together, right? So that's kind of always uh, you know one of the animating motives for for all of the characters, I think. I'm going into our Q&A tab and Fatima, we talked a little bit about voices coming to you and you deciding that you needed to get the story out. 
Fatima says, the characters are all so different and so completely developed. Did you work out each completely before writing the book or did you write them as you wrote the book? Oh, that's that's a wonderful question. Um, I worked them out before I wrote the book. Not, maybe not completely, that would be a stretch. But I, uh, I create a profile for, for all the characters, major characters, minor characters, characters who are unnamed and just have a walk-on part, as it were. Uh, I have a file or a dossier profile on each of those characters. I'm asking them things like, what are they afraid of? What do they believe in? How do they feel about love, right? How do they feel about death? What do they think about the future? Uh, what are their strengths and weaknesses? I, I, ask, the, I ask the characters, tough questions. Now, I always want to know more answers than my readers do. So I'm not going to share everything I find out in those conversations. I'm going to share the parts that I think will advance the story and serve the story. Uh, but Fatima's question, yeah, I, do, I absolutely do that. I do, a, I do a profile. Now, I say I don't work it out completely because I do leave room for surprises, right? Uh, I do, you know, as, as, the, as the text progress, sometimes characters are going to do uh, something different from what I initially imagined they would do. And usually when they do that, I let them do that. I don't say, oh, the story is going in, a, in another direction. I decide to follow them and see where it leads. Hmm. We have a question from an anonymous attendee that asks, this is more process, what is the best piece of writing advice you've received that you still use in your own writing? Uh, probably uh, two things. One I've talked about a little bit, uh, so I'm going to contradict myself a little bit. One of the best things, uh, advice I got was, you know, read all the time, right? And so, uh, and I, I do think that's really important. Um, but in terms of, of my own process, as, as I said before, I've now reached a point where I have to tell myself enough reading, <laughs> you know, sit down and, and, and do the work. Mm -hmm. um, the other uh, really good piece of advice. Um, that I got was um, don't give up, right? Because um, it's a it's it's a it's a calling that inevitably involves rejection, right? I mean, um, you're going to submit things, and people are going to say we can't use that. Ah, I see. You know what I mean? That that kind of rejection, um, and um, you know those can pile up, and uh, you have to. You have to shake them off. You have to develop a, a, a skin. And uh, I, I, there was this poet uh, years ago when I was just starting out. And this is before you know people could do electronic submissions. You had to like put a self-addressed stamped envelope and all of that, right? So I'm from that era. But I remember him saying, I remember him saying, well, when a poem comes back to me, right, and, and that envelope that I've addressed myself, I don't look at it as a rejected poem. I look at it as a poem that hasn't found its home yet. Mm. right and that really influenced me right it's like I it's not the end of the world if something comes back to you it just hasn't found its home yet right so I, I would say that's probably the other aspect of it don't don't dwell on rejection uh it's going to happen it's not going to happen all the time but eventually someone out there is going to be like hey that piece you sent in I'd like to run that piece right and like, yes this is applicable <laughs> to books and life okay totally, um, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get discouraged at all while writing this book? Did I get discouraged? No, I, I don't think I did. Um, I uh, yeah, I mainly worked on it on like breaks from, from my job uh, teaching and uh, I, I mapped it out uh, pretty thoroughly. And also when, I, when I'm ending a writing session, I, I like to end it incompletely, sort of mm -hmm. like half finished uh, so that I have a place to begin. Um, when I start again. And so I, it, it was all, the action was always kind of unfolding in the back of my mind, even when I wasn't writing. So, and also I knew the arc of the story. So I, the, the initial circumstances that the characters were in uh, didn't overwhelm me because I knew where they were, where they were going and how they were going to respond uh, to the circumstances. Hmm. One of the other things in my posted in the book is this idea of squandered talent. I think there's even a moment in the work where the characters ponder what would happen if, I, we're gonna let you tell it, <laughs> just tell us a little bit about this idea of squandered talent. If, if 
Black people had the freedom to live independently, like what would be, what would be achieved if we didn't spend the first like couple centuries here being oppressed? Yeah, well, I think one of the, uh, I'm not sure if I know the specific uh, scene that you're referring to, but one of the characters for me kind of up symbol, symbolizes that. Uh, there's a character um, in the book named Milton and Milton uh, to me kind of um, symbolizes this idea of lost genius. So uh, a couple things, one, there's, there's this quote, uh, I'm gonna mutilate it, so Google it, <laughs> look it up. Uh, the scientist Stephen Jay Gould has this wonderful quote about Einstein. And you know, he says, it basically he says, yeah, Einstein's pretty interesting, but what interests me more is all of those Einsteins at the bottom of the Atlantic, mm -hmm. right? Who, who, who never got to be Einstein mm -hmm. uh, because you know uh, they died in the Middle Passage. Uh, so Milton is this character who is an extraordinary uh, visual genius. He can take a stick and draw in the dirt and just, uh, he can, all, he's, he's, he's sort of mystical. I mean, I don't really, that's not the ideal word in that he can draw from real life, but he can also draw from his imagination in a way that reflects uh, experiences and knowledge that he, he doesn't actually have, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so he, he, he does these wonderful drawings and all of the others stolen are familiar with them. They commission him you know, draw, draw my baby, do this, do that. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the session, they always wipe the drawing out, right? And his genius remains a secret among the thieves. They have no idea that, you know, there's this, there's this absolute visual arts genius uh, in chains in, in the quarters. And so that character partly is a reflection of that idea of how much, uh, how often genius is overlooked and how often uh, genius is restrained and, and never allowed to bloom and, and find its natural form. Hmm. Is there anyone in this piece that's representative of anyone in your real life? Um, I would say no. no. I would say, <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they're all, I mean, I think aspects of people you may know may sometimes appear uh, and work that's certainly true of some of my fiction, uh, mm -hmm. but I would say less so in this book than than in the other works of fiction I've written. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Margaret isn't like your wife. Margaret isn't like based on anybody that's given you like <laughs> hope and inspiration and causing you to think. I read it and I was like, I bet, I bet this is his wife. Because <laughs> well, when they have the conversation and they decide to flee, like it's a coming around a little. Well, bit. I mean that's that that that's a fair point. I'd like to think that. If I were in those circumstances, uh, my wife probably would say, you know, what Margaret says. In the book. <laughs> yeah, she probably would. If, if you put it that, if you put it that way. Uh, but, but you know, my my wife functions more uh, in the creation of the book as sort of a first reader or, or oh. a first listener. You know, I, I'll read her, I'll read her parts, or she'll, you know, all of my books are dedicated to her because you know she's kind of, she's the. Uh, you know, I say like Milton is sort of the hidden genius in the novel. Mm -hmm. well, uh, my wife is sort of, you know, my hidden genius. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> she, she'll, you know, I can read her apart and she'll go, no, it's not there yet. Or that's wonderful. You know what I mean? She'll, or she'll ask a question. What about this? What about that? So mm -hmm. all of that's very helpful and illuminating. Excellent. Um, is there a theme or a topic that you're like itching to get out now after having done this work? I don't know, artistically, if you got to go through like a cleanse period and then how your next work appears to you, but. Uh, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, that that's a good question because sometimes I, I have had to go uh, through a cleanse period or like, for example, um, when I wrote the N word, as you know, it's, you know, I, I spent, I spent seven years, you know, studying white supremacy, basically delusional white supremacy, uh, and and all of its manifestations, not not just in language, because I wanted to connect this racist language to to uh, you know racist cosmology, racist mm -hmm. beliefs, racist uh, politics. So at the at the end of the day, a lot of times when I was immersed in that, um, I did, you know, I needed to shake it off. You know, it's like you want to take a shower, right? Um, and so that's when I began to write a taste of honey, which was my first. Uh, collection of fiction it was short story it was really to kind of like shake off you know the the residue mm -hmm. of, of the n-word 
uh, with Yonder, less so, right? I, I didn't necessarily have that need. So I was able to, to jump, you know, right into other things, but I'm never just working on one project. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so I was working on other things while I was working on Yonder, right? Which, which maybe helps. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Because it was, again, very heavy, very heavy. Um, some questions from our internal team. Who do you draw inspiration from and why? Uh, well, I guess my, my primary inspiration is my, my family. Uh, my wife and I have been together 39 years. We have five children, uh, all grown now. Um, those, are, those are my favorite people. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are my favorite six people. Uh, and so they they're they're very important, I think. And then also uh, my ancestors, you know, I, I write with my ancestors over my shoulder. I know that they endured uh, and overcame uh, precisely so that I could do what I do. I mean, that, that that's kind of how I I view it. And I want to honor them all mm -hmm. the time. I never want to dishonor them. So mm -hmm. uh, I want I want their approval. Uh, so that motivates me as well. And then in terms of, of artists, uh, you know, Toni Morrison, Ralph Ellison, uh, Gene Toomer, uh, the artwork on the cover of Yonder uh, is from the great, great artist, Jacob Lawrence. Yeah. Uh, you know, just really, really important to me. Uh, he's, he's one of my, uh, one of the artists that I, I most admire. And I was really thrilled that his estate gave us permission uh, to use his artwork on, on the cover because, um, it was my cover uh, when I was first typing the manuscript, when I was first Oh, wow, writing. you knew. Yeah, all, all the time. So even when it was submitted to publishers, that artwork was already in place. Didn't have permission at the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, when I got a copy of the book, it looked, I was like, is this Jacob Lawrence? Because I, <clears throat> he was showing at one of the museums um, right when we were emerging out of quarantine and I went to go buy the entire book he has panels of things that are hanging in our student center at I went to Howard so yep also a fan um you just took one of my questions though because oh. <laughs> I love I love Jacob Lawrence and I love the artwork um and I think it's a really neat expression of the joy and the love and all of the themes that run through the piece um Another internal question, as a professor going into work now, how do you translate your writing into your work? Uh, you know, I, I don't know um, if a lot of professors do this, but, but one thing that I do is that I, I, I do share my experience as a working writer as it's unfolding. Um, and uh, I remember when I first got to Emerson, there was a, there was a television uh, professor who was showing in his classes a pilot project, a pilot television program that he was developing that ultimately was rejected, that mm. didn't make it. Um, and he was saying that he thought that his quote unquote failures were as illustrative as his successes. And he wanted to kind of take students through that process so they could see what it would be like for them. So I, uh, I do use a lot of examples from my own experience. Like I, I, I have a lecture where I talk about outlining a lot. So I will show, I, so I, I use uh, the out, as an example, I use an outline for an essay I wrote for, New Re for the New Republic magazine on Frederick Douglass. So I kind of take the students through the outline and kind of show them the finished work and say, this is how one thing leads to another, right? So uh, I believe that, you know, all writing is in conversation with all other writing. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that's one of the things I'm always stressing to the students and um, trying to, uh, I don't know, encourage this idea that we're having a conversation, right? I'm in the conversation, they're in a conversation. As, as fellow writers, we're entering a conversation that began long before us, right? So we need to find a space in it and contribute something new, right? So that's, that, that's often what we're talking about in class. I wonder, do all your forms of writing, your poetry, plays, their adult books, does it all give you the same satisfaction or did you find that you were more happy to look at this one than some of the work that you've done previously? Well, I, journalistic I, I, columns too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I tend to be biased. You know, I tend to really like the, the last thing I did, you know, because it's, it's kind of fresh, right? Uh, so I, I'm, I'm sort of that guy. 
Uh, but it just in terms of writing in general, poetry is my first love, mm -hmm. remains my first love. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to continue to be published when I have things to share. It tends to find a home. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm really happy about that. But um, I, I grew into the other forms and I, I, like the, I like them equally. I also write for the stage. I just really like writing. Uh, and my, my students think I'm being facetious, but I'm not in that I don't have any hobbies. It's reading and writing for me. That's it. I do it all the time. So, but it makes me happy. It doesn't feel like labor to me. One of our anonymous attendees is asking for you, what is the most difficult aspect of writing? Hmm, that's that's a good question. I think uh, hmm, I'm not sure. One one thing I would say, um, sometimes it's difficult to turn it off when I have other things to do. Right? It's like I could do this all day. Can't can't do this all day. I've got mm -hmm. so many other uh, demands on my time. That's why I try to end things you know sort of incompletely so that I know that I can uh, return to it. So that that that's probably the hardest part because sometimes. Uh, when you sit down to do the work, you you don't enter the world of the work uh, quickly and smoothly, and it takes you a while to get going. And then you get going, and time's up. You got to go do something else, uh, and that can be frustrating. That can be frustrating. Hmm. So then, how do you drop it? Unwind. Unwind. Yeah. If you're constantly thinking about writing, how do you shut yourself off? You said that you said like you're thinking about it all the time and an yeah. image of like someone at dinner just going like oh I have to get this out like give me my notepad you're laughing well, so it, it, it must be like that it's it's similar to that it's it's <laughs> not not that intense it's like um, my my son is a writer and I had a self conscious moment he was doing a an interview his first book came out last year and he said well you know my dad was always working but my dad was always present at the same time wow so it's like. <laughs> I didn't know what he was going to say there. <laughs> <laughs> Who's my dad? I don't know the man. He's a stranger to me. Oh, no. No. Uh, so, uh, yes, I, I mean, I, I think I just, uh, I mean, I met my wife in college. She knows I am. She knows it's, 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 it's going in the, in the back of my mind. Yeah, I'm not sure that it ever uh, shuts off, but I think it's going for a reason, right? And I have an obligation uh, to sort of see what I can do with those ideas and express them to the best of my ability. And I also feel like if I'm too casual about them, they will leave me and go somewhere else. Mm. And I don't want that to happen. <laughs> okay. um, our guest, Danny asks, how do you feel about the promotional aspect of publishing and marketing a book? Is this something you enjoy or something you dread? Uh, it's a great question. It's not something I dread. Um, I, I understood when I entered this calling that that it's necessary, that, that, that it's a part of what we do. Um, I don't enjoy it at the same time, you know, um, because there's so many aspects of it I, I can't control, right? Like you and I are having a, a very controlled conversation. You're an informed journalist who's read my work. That's ideal circumstances. <laughs> Sometimes it's someone who's just, you know, they can't even, remember, they can't. So tell us about the writing of Thunder. And you have to go, actually, it's, it's called Yonder. <laughs> <laughs> Not that, none of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's different now because I'm not traveling remotely as much as I used to, although I am traveling. But, you know, for two years, I did everything virtually. Um, it's, it's, it's tiresome. And also, after you've after you finished, after you've gone through every aspect of publication, you do want to take a deep breath. But there is no deep breath. That's, that's when the publicist contacts you and says, I've got these things lined up for you. And, of course, you need to do them, right, so that people will know about the book and, and, and support it. So um, also related to Danny's question, I would say the hardest part of it for me is social media. Hmm. Uh, they want you to post things on Twitter and <laughs> Instagram and Facebook. That's really, that's really hard. And so many of my friends, they, they, who are writers, you know, they post things basically like went to get a haircut today, man, I love haircuts. <laughs> Like, Engagement. I'm, like I'm, I'm not going to do that. So <laughs> I'm gonna do the best I can, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do stuff like that. So that's probably the hardest part of promoting that whole. Uh, have you tweeted anything? Like, oh no, I haven't. Uh, let me see what I can think of. You know, there's pressure there. A little bit of pressure. Uh, Marianne and Chris from Kingston 
We're curious if you've ever written a screenplay in any form, limited series, etc. We loved your book. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've written a number of, of screenplays. I've not had anything uh, produced. Um, yes. When I was in my 20s, I actually went out to LA for like six months with, with screenplays under my arm and knocked on doors and tried, tried to break into that business. And I got nowhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so I remember telling my wife, I said, well, you know, I, I'm, because I didn't have a prejudice. I was like, I'll write in any form, right? And uh, I said, what, whatever sticks, I'm going to like really go with it and see what happens. And as soon as I said that, uh, journalism began to stick. I started having, you know, like real successes in journalism. So I was like, well, that's the way I'm going to go for a while. But if the screenplay uh, efforts had stuck at the time, that's probably what I would be doing. Hmm. Got it. Um, going back a little to where you're from, um, Northside St. Louis, I know I've heard you say that it was racially polarized when you were growing up. How much of that drives the subject matter that you like to deal with? Um, I mean, that, that's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, the, the town of uh, St. Louis was uh, completely uh, segregated. The north side was all black, south side was all white. Uh, but I was in the gifted program. So mm -hmm. I actually went to school on the south side. Mm -hmm. So I had a really different experience now. I, I took two buses to get to the south side. Uh, I, I spent all day in a white world, essentially. And then I went back to the black community. Uh, and I think those, those experiences really inform uh, what I write, but also give me a confidence um, because I've been in that world for so long and I know I can navigate it and I know I can uh, compete in it. Um, so, uh, but the fiction, not so much yonder, but the earlier, uh, the two earlier books are set in a fictional version of St. Louis called Gateway City. Um, and so my experiences uh, growing up there undoubtedly uh, shaped those two books. One takes place in the 60s, one takes place in the 70s. And my ambition is to uh, write a novel about each each decade in that community from the 60s to the present. We'll see how that works out. Our guest, Stephen Pugh, says, uh, when learning about these horrors of history, there are facts which seem removed from the human experience. Then there's facing the brutal human experience, which can be overwhelming. Is there a way to bring the facts and the human experience together? That's from Stephen. I would argue from reading the book that this is exactly the way. What yeah, they I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the mission of art, right? To 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 bring bring those facts uh, together with the human element. Like we were talking earlier about the the Jacob Lawrence, uh, the Jacob Lawrence uh, detail on the on the book comes from his Harriet Tubman series. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is, you know, what, like, you know, 40 panels or something. And most of them are about what you would imagine they would be about because they're doing the period of enslavement. But then in the middle of them, uh, our panel number four, I think it is, yep. you have these children turning cartwheels in a field in, in the midst of, you know, all, all of this horror. And there is the human element among the, the, the hard facts of the experience. And I think that's why that panel uh, struck me so much, and I thought that's kind of what I, what I hoped to do in my art, uh, and what I what I hoped I did in Yonder. So I, I think the short answer is that that's part of the role of art, you know, not the only role, but certainly uh, to help us reconcile uh, those those two different dimensions, uh, the the human element and the horror uh, that history um, contains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you definitely did that again. Um, before I let you go, do we see William and Margaret and Cato and Pandora again? You mean in, in another book? Mm -hmm. um, I have no plans for such. <laughs> right now? <laughs> Will it evolve? They have spoken. No, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I hadn't thought about it, so I don't know. And Remains to be seen. And are you willing to tell us anything about what comes next for you? Um, I have two uh, children's books coming out this year. Uh, one comes out next month. It's called Me and Muhammad Ali. It's a picture book for primary grade readers. It's about a little boy's encounter uh, with the boxing champion. Uh, and then in December, I have uh, a child's introduction to jazz, uh, which is for middle school readers. And it's a companion to an earlier book I wrote called A Child's Introduction to African-American History. So that's what's next. Exciting. Excellent. 
Well, Jabari Asim, I want to thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you all for tuning into this evening's Beyond the Page discussion. Um, and again, this discussion is incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Soraya. You were great. I really appreciate it. Uh, we hope you had an amazing evening with us. I'm excited to announce next month's Beyond the Page author will be Jonathan Franzen. You can register now for this event with the link in the chat. And with that, we'll say good night. Bye, everyone.